It's opening day, and Walt Disney is driving along the Santa Ana Freeway to LAX. The morning dawned hot, and it will only get hotter. It's a few minutes before six in the morning. In the scant eight and a half hours, the park's gates will open. Two hours after that, cameras roll on the live ABC television broadcast, the largest live television event to date. For now, Walt needs to get to the airport so he can greet VIP guests arriving for the opening. Most of them are executives from the various corporations Walt and his brother Roy managed to convince to invest in the park. Today, they will see what their money, $17 million in total, has bought. Compared to what the future will bring, it's not a lot. The park will open with attractions, scenery, theming, and even an entire land, Tomorrowland, unfinished. In that moment, however, the investments have wrought something entirely unique. Main Street USA, in particular, offers an innovation it will take decades to appreciate. Unlike the melange of historical periods on display in Henry Ford's Greenfield Village, Wed Enterprises used the tricks of movie making to build Main Street as living sets, scale buildings that present an idealized, and also unrealistic, vision of a turn-of-the-century Midwestern American town. Shops, a cinema, an arcade, and of course the firehouse line the street, culminating in the silhouette of Sleeping Beauty's castle. It towers over the gardened hub, which branches to each of the different lands. Trotting up and down the street are horse-drawn streetcars, still in use today, surreys, and even a fire wagon. For the first time, visitors to an amusement park are transported to a themed area where the illusion of being in a separate world is unbroken. And even as this illusion is developed, moving up the street towards the castle, it is broken. As the rest of the lands come into view, the scale of Disney's project becomes clear. This is no longer an amusement park in the traditional sense. A new lexicon is needed to describe this world Walt has made. The first themed amusement park, a theme park, is ready to open. Driving back to the park a few hours later, Walt is followed by cars and a helicopter bringing relatives, celebrities, honored guests, old friends, and investors. These will be the first guests brought into the park for the day. Some of them will take part in the opening ceremonies. Arriving at Disneyland, the crowds are already gathering outside the gates. The park is slated to open at 2.30 local time. Two hours after that, the television broadcast starts. Despite billing the telecast and today's event as a whole as the opening day of Disneyland, today's event is not public. Technically, it's a press preview, with special tickets acting as invites. Of course, some enterprising sort realized the tickets were easily copied and proceeded to make counterfeits. C.V. Wood, in charge of building the park and employee of the Stanford Research Institute, estimated the park's capacity at 15,000 guests. Today's planned crowd is close to that number, as a test. But there are uninvited guests arriving by the minute. As the gates open and the first guests enter the park, Walt is standing over Main Street, watching from his apartment window in the firehouse, smiling and crying. With him are the two dozen child cast members of the new Mickey Mouse Club television show, which won't debut until almost three months from now, on October 3rd. Today is their first introduction to the public, and they will have their own special place in the parade and events to come. Below the window, facing the street, are the Firehouse 5 Plus 2, a marching jazz band consisting of Disney employees, including Walt's friends Ward Kimball, Harper Goff, and Frank Thomas. Later, they will play during the telecast for the segment dedicating Frontierland. As Walt walks down from his apartment to the train station to board the engine E.P. Ripley, he tells the band to roam the park, playing wherever they find a crowd until the telecast. The day hasn't been the easiest for Walt thus far. Despite the moment watching the crowds pour in at his window, the past two hours have brought seeming disaster upon disaster. The discovery of the counterfeit tickets didn't take long, but when it was realized, there was no real solution. It was an easier problem to solve when someone was found with a ladder, letting people climb over the fence for $5 each. The expected crowd of 15,000 
by the end of the day will be estimated closer to double, 28,000. That said, being too popular is a good problem. Just ask Michael Eisner about the opening day of Euro Disneyland. We made mistakes, and that was just really stupid. It's just stupid. These issues did, however, reveal a problem with the park's crowd management, despite all the effort Wed and Walt himself had dedicated to the question. Two other problems, like the incomplete theming, were a result of the rushed construction schedule, plumbing, and asphalt. As a result of a plumber's strike, Walt was forced to choose between having toilets or water fountains available for opening day. He chose toilets, for obvious reason, but the decision had ramifications. The heat was uncomfortable at best. Some attending the event estimated temperatures above 100 degrees, but data for the day from the nearest weather station, nine miles away in Los Alamitos, records a high of only 80 degrees. That said, Los Alamitos is closer to the ocean and thus would be cooler. A disparity of 20 degrees, however, seems unlikely. Despite the claims of some sources that the temperatures were somewhere around 100 degrees, it seems that the low 90s is probably a more accurate estimate. That said, a lack of water fountains on a 90 degree summer day in Southern California and a crush of more than 25,000 people is still a problem. The issues with the asphalt were simpler. They merely waited too long to pour it and didn't give it enough time to set. The uncured asphalt, given more time or cooler temperatures, could have cured, but it didn't. As a result, the asphalt stayed gummy in the hot July afternoon. Men's shoes, including those of Frank Sinatra, stuck to the ground. Women's heels, the expected standard fashion of the day, sunk into the gooey walkways. Walt was likely aware of all these issues as he walked onto the train, but he was too busy with being in place for the most ambitious live television broadcast to date. Walt boards the train, driving it himself out of the station and around the park. In the locomotive with him are a couple of dignitaries, the governor of California and the president of the Santa Fe Railroad. He lets them both drive the train a little as they make their way around the park, waiting for their TV queue. In the carriages behind them are other special guests, several celebrities, and the children of the various foreign consulates in Los Angeles, all dressed in costumes representing their home countries, of course. As the telecast gets underway, host Art Linkletter is standing on the train tracks in front of the Main Street station. While he introduces his family, fellow hosts Bob Cummings and Ronald Reagan, yes, future President Ronald Reagan, and the park to the TV audience, Walt has a moment of calm before the busiest part of his day. The cameras take a trip up Main Street in an early automobile from 1898, with Bob Cummings describing the shops and attractions along the way. The first flub of the broadcast happens when a member of the crew, trying to keep the road clear for the camera, walks into view repeatedly, at one point ducking to try and get out of the shot. Walt, on cue, lets the throttle out, bringing the train around the final bend and into the station. He greets Art Linkletter, disembarks the train, and has a little banter with Fred Gurley, president of the Santa Fe. And of the Santa Fe and Disneyland, if you please. <laughs> That's right. Now, <laughs> vice president of the Santa Fe and Disneyland. <laughs> While Linkletter finishes up coverage on the train and the broadcast takes an advertising break, Walt poses for a few photos in front of the locomotive. He then walks down from the station to the flagpole at the beginning of Main Street. Waiting there were representatives from various faiths, including Reverend Glenn Pewter, his niece's husband, who Walt selected to deliver the dedication. Walt takes his place several paces away from a microphone, while Ronald Reagan introduces him. Watching for his cue, Walt walks up to the microphone, cheered on by the crowd and the dignitaries gathered behind him. He then delivers the dedication of Disneyland, written by Winston Hibbler. To all who come, come to this happy place, place welcome. welcome. Disneyland is your land. Here age relives fond memories of the past. And here youth may savor the challenge and promise of the future. Disneyland is dedicated to the ideals, the dreams, and the hard facts that have created America, with the hope that it will be a source of joy and inspiration to all the world. Thank you. Walt walks back to the assembled group, 
and the second major flub of the broadcast happens. Reverend Pewter, getting his cue early, walks to the microphone. Ronald Reagan begins introducing him, only to be cut off mid-sentence as the Reverend begins his speech. After a brief prayer, the governor gives another brief speech, and the flag is raised over Main Street by members of the military, as the U.S. Marine Band plays. The military marching band begins the parade by walking down Main Street, and the telecast goes a little off the rails. Ronald Reagan cues up Art Linkletter, but instead the camera cuts to a shot of Walt, the governor, and their wives trying to find the correct 1903 Pierce automobile for the parade. Walt runs through the shot, trying to catch up. As they climb into the cars and the band marches off down Main Street, jets from the 146th Fighter Interceptor Wing of the California Air National Guard fly over. They are a few moments later than intended, and the camera whips to the sky trying to catch them. A couple of camera changes later, no jets appear, and Art Linkletter, who Ronald Reagan threw coverage to 90 seconds ago, finally appears on screen. Linkletter does his best to narrate the parade, but the camera struggles to ever be on the correct subject. Following Walt and the governor are a few other dignitaries and cars, a selection of Disney characters like Snow White, Cinderella, and the characters in the Ice Capades costumes. After these are the representatives of the different lands. In Frontierland, the governor of Tennessee and actor Danny Thomas, along with his family, ride in wagons waving to the crowds. Next, in the Tomorrowland segment, are cars from the Autopia attraction. Then are the Adventureland and Fantasyland segments, but the telecast cuts away to Bob Cummings, standing at the Main Street end of the hub. The different members of the parade break off to their respective lands, as Cummings is cut off by an advertising break. When the telecast returns, Walt is standing at the entrance to Frontierland, reading its dedication. When he's finished, the telecast cuts to Ronald Reagan for the gates on the stockade to open. He kicks coverage over to Art Linkletter, who again misses the cue. The rest of the segment runs smoothly, though. Fess Parker and Buddy Ebsen, playing their Davy Crockett and George Russell characters from the Disneyland television show, arrive and sing a musical number about Crockett's gun. This is followed by a dance segment and a reprise of the song, with Linkletter awkwardly standing around watching. Afterwards, as another ad break cuts in, Parker and Linkletter go over to the mule train ride to load kids onto the mules. When the telecast resumes, Bob Cummings is on screen standing in front of the Golden Horseshoe. He gives a description of the Golden Horseshoe, waiting for the cue from the Mark Twain for its christening. The riverboat has already had its issues today. Earlier, a chunk of window fell on the head of a visiting state senator. Now, it has been overloaded and is listing heavily to port. Despite this, it's sailed off on cue as the camera follows it along the river. Next comes a segment in New Orleans hosted by Bob Cummings, with the aforementioned Firehouse 5 Plus 2 playing a musical number. Dancers perform a routine to the music as cameras follow them around. At the end of the segment is a moment some sources claim was a gaffe. The camera cuts to a shot of Bob Cummings kissing one of the female dancers. The moment, however, appears scripted. Cummings and the dancer play it like they're surprised, but the camera shot is too composed to be an accident. And the cue for the next segment, the train whistle from the Frontierland station, sounds just seconds before the camera cuts. In addition, close viewing shows that Cummings and the dancer are out of the initial shot by mere inches. Wait, is that Harper Goff? After a brief bit about the CK Holiday train engine by Reagan and another ad break, the telecast resumes with Walt, standing in front of the world clock at the entrance to Tomorrowland. Even he wasn't immune from the telecast's hiccups. This is a fine man's achievement. I thought I got a signal. Paul Stewart, he did. Paul. Before our preview of Tomorrowland, Tomorrowland's coverage continues through the Aluminum Hall of Fame, Autopia, where Sammy Davis Jr. rear ends Frank Sinatra, the Phantom Boats, and the Moonliner, complete with its entire pre show film. At some point during the day, whether before this moment or now, Walt is walking from one location to another for the telecast. A security guard, told not to let anyone through, stops Walt. Walt tells the man, quote, Either you let me through here, or I'm going to hit you right in the face and walk over your body. 
After an ad break following the Moonliner segment, Walt is sitting on the rocks overlooking the moat in front of Sleeping Beauty's castle. The dedication is the only part of the Fantasyland segment that will go smoothly. The castle's drawbridge is lowered, and Ice Capade's characters lead a group of children across into Fantasyland. A medley of Disney songs plays, including When You Wish Upon a Star, When I See an Elephant Fly, I'm Late, and You Can Fly. Dancers, dressed as characters from the various animated films, performed choreographed numbers around some of the attractions. Footage from the animated films was intercut into the telecast's live performance. Art Linkletter introduces the Peter Pan's flight attraction and kicks it over to Bob Cummings for the Snow White Adventures, as Hi Ho plays and the dwarves all run over to the ride. As Cummings starts to introduce the attraction, however, he stops mid-sentence and the coverage cuts back to Linkletter at Peter Pan's flight. The telecast never returns to the Snow White attraction. Instead, another advertising break is followed by a segment on the Casey Jr. Circus Train and the Canal Boats of the World. Art Linkletter, after introducing the Casey Jr. Train and Canal Boats, sends the telecast over to Bob Cummings on the Chicken of the Sea. The camera struggles to get Cummings in frame, and he struggles with his microphone. After speaking with Bobby Driscoll, star of Treasure Island, as well as the voice and visual inspiration for Peter Pan, Cummings notices Linkletter in front of Mr. Toad's wild ride, unable to find his microphone. Cameras cut to the confused Linkletter as someone jumps it and helps him find the mic. After the Mr. Toad segment comes the final missed cue of the show, with Cummings on the ship introducing Mickey Mouse and Minnie, followed by more commercials. Oh, you're waiting for me? Oh, thank you, everybody. Is the telecast closes with Walt and Art Linkletter standing in the hub in front of the drawbridge to Sleeping Beauty Castle. They send coverage over to Adventureland, the only land not to get a special dedication message from Walt. Bob Cummings gives a brief description of the Jungle Cruise attraction and sends the telecast to its final break. The telecast resumes with Walt and Art in front of the castle again for the sign-off. An estimated 17 million Americans watched the telecast, more than 40% of the population. Walt spent the next couple hours finishing business with the TV crew and the park staff. By sunset, at 8, Walt was back in his apartment on Main Street with Art Linkletter. The two had a late dinner on the patio, watching the fireworks over the castle. Linkletter noticed Disney taking notes during the display. He was counting each explosion to make sure he got everything he paid for. The reviews of the day, and over the coming weeks, were mostly positive. There were, however, naysayers. Some predicted the park would become dirty or run down within a few years. Others said the park wouldn't even last that long. One critic called the park a nightmare, but all the negative reviews proved wrong. Over 150,000 guests visited during the first week. In less than four, that number was half a million. Disneyland welcomed its millionth guest in September, a little more than two months after opening. By the end of that first year of operation, the park welcomed 3.6 million visitors and regularly exceeded the original 15,000 predicted capacity. Despite the longest day of the year being five days away, the opening of Disneyland must have felt like one of the longest days in Walt's life. With no sleep, he worked from before sunrise until after sunset. It also must have been one of the happiest, Despite the stresses and failures to finish the park on time, despite the mistakes, accidents, problems, and emergencies, Walt had done it. Since he was a kid, he wanted an amusement park. Having children of his own only emphasized that desire. And after more than a decade and a half of setbacks, seemingly blind alleys, strikes, losses, delays, and deadlines, Walt finally realized his dream. From this day forward, his dream would be shared with the world. Thank you.